Hey everybody and welcome to the show. I'm James, that's Katie, and that makes this the first ever episode 22 of Cloud Control, the gaming podcast that's not just good, it's good enough. And Kate, you know what? Uh, everyone, it's, the, it's NHL playoff time. The stars are in the playoffs. We're cheering for them as a podcast community. And these guys are out here sacrificing their bodies, they're blocking shots, they're taking hits, and they're doing everything they can to win. And I just want you to know, Kate, that's what I'm doing on the podcast here today, because I'm dealing with a bit of a headache today at this time, and I'm still here to show up to record this today. So I just want you to know I'm battling out there just like my stars. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to get through this together. Yeah, some, I mean, that's a sacrifice. Some would say that's like, you know, you got the true athlete spirit. You got your, what did, what did 2K Sports say? You got your head in the game. <laughs> we, are, we are ready to have a podcast. <laughs> We're ready to have a podcast. That's right. If they can, if they can go do that amazing physical toll on their bodies, I can stand here for an hour and change and chat about some video games that I sat on the couch and played <laughs> earlier today. So it'll be just fine. Everybody, don't worry. Um, okay. Well, uh, let's get right into it then. Today's show, we're going to talk about I Beat Resident Evil 4, everybody. This is exciting. Uh, Kate's got another game to talk about, too. And then at the end of the show, uh, we're going to point out some of our favorite stuff from the latest Nintendo indie world, because we always like to go through all the presentations. And there was like, what, you say 23 games announced at the indie world? That was That's quite a few. It was only 20 minutes was, long. Yeah, yeah, that's like a <laughs> game a minute. Um, I think it's 23 with one being like a remaster and then I right, think 20 right. some are like DLCs or like updates and stuff but yeah I think 20 yeah, yeah, yeah. announcements which is great cool all right well we'll get to that at the end of the show so uh we'll look forward to that at when we get to it, uh, let's start off. I beat Resident Evil 4, everybody. And I spoke about this on the show last time. And I was, you know, I was really high on it when I played last time. You know, I didn't have too much going on. I want to report, first of all, number one thing off the bat. I, re I said last time there was an audio glitch with my game. And then Kate so inspiringly pointed out that maybe I just had the, the mic down on my controller. Uh, and it mm -hmm. turns out that's exactly that was the problem. And there was no glitch. Uh, I just had the mic down and I feel like a total idiot uh, because we always talk <laughs> yeah. about how cool the dual sense is and I, I don't know what yeah. happened. I think I just must have been playing something where I didn't like what came out of the controller and turned it off and I just forgot. So that's on me. Uh, there's no glitch. Uh, and it was great. You know, once I had that on for the back half of the game, really enjoyed it, everybody. <laughs> Sound effects were awesome. <laughs> Does that make it scarier? I feel like it would be even scarier with sound. Like, because mm. I, always, I always think that like, I always think of Demon Souls when I think of that. Maybe just the first game I played on my PlayStation but like in that game like your footsteps came out of the controller so it really felt like it was like sound coming from you so I feel like in a horror game that could potentially be so terrifying to have the sound like it's right behind you instead of like you know from your TV you would you would think so but the the thing is the game only had it only uses it for those kind of comms communications or when you reload oh, okay. your gun the sound kind of comes out of there and that sounds really awesome I will say but it doesn't use it for like the atmosphere like anything scary so okay. yeah i will say that that gives me a little bit of stress off my back because that sounds cool and immersive but i actually don't want to be terrified <laughs> exactly, so, that's exactly. yeah and you know i would say maybe that's a good place to start off with what i want to say about this game is that um just the feeling that this game had now i was saying last time like I think this is going to rank pretty high up my list. And I was just working on my top 50 games list. Um, and this game did rank really high. And I know I'm like really soon after finishing it, but just this game just feels good. I just love the way that this game made me feel as the player throughout. And I think that if you're looking for like a really scary horror game, this probably isn't what you're looking for. Like it, it definitely is creepy and has like a lot of, you know, really crazy cult stuff and like dismembered bodies and like all that like you'll definitely see some scary stuff but more than that like I just think the the game is like got this great mix of like it's horror but it's so silly and there's like a good amount of action and it's it's just this amazing package and coming out of it as the player I just feel like you know it's it just paced so perfectly and you get through this scary part and then you're like, wow, I can't believe I killed all those guys. I feel so good about myself. I'm just kind of scraping by with these few bullets. And then all of a sudden you're in this next section where you've got tons of ammo and you're just killing a bunch of guys and it's not scary at all. It's like an arena fight. And then all of a sudden you're in the, through the next door and you're like flashlight out through this cobweb filled, you know, staircase. And it's just like this excellent pacing throughout. Um, 
and you just like I just couldn't wait to see what was next. I can't believe how fast I got through the game, considering going back to relating what I was saying last time about my experience with Resident Evil 2, which was a game that I feel like I was I was so slow and scared and like, you know, really got stuck in it in that way because I was almost like apprehensive. But this game just mm-hmm. drags you through it at this perfect clip. Um, and, you know, the last thing, I guess, I don't know if you have any questions about that, but like the way that it goes, it's like scarier at the start, you know, like a good horror movie, scary at the mm-hmm. start. But once you know what the monster is or what the threat is, typically it's like a little less scary. And that game, this game, sorry, takes advantage of that so well, because as you get more used to like, these are the zombies, these are the creatures, the last like kind of couple hours of the game are like very action focused and it's, it's, it just works so well. Um, yeah, love it. <laughs> That's awesome. So yeah, you become a lot more capable. So mm-hmm. I'm I'm assuming it's a very clear answer here then, but I would say you prefer this kind of like campy, funny action horror versus the more like in kind of like intense song yeah, yeah. that two has got going on. Yeah, I just I think it's more than that. I think it's also like the, the pacing of like the and the the mm-hmm. action as well. Like in two, you're definitely or I felt more restricted in terms of like you really have to be careful about your bullets and like, oh my God, like the enemies are respawning in this room that I have to go back to. So like, I've got to make sure I'm equipped to go and deal with them again. Whereas in this game, once you've cleared an area out for the most part, like it's kind of, um, it maintains that, that like safeness. So you don't have to worry about like, you know, backtracking if you forgot to pick up something or if you see like, oh, there's a, you know, pack of ammo I forgot back there or a treasure, like I can go back and get that safely. Um, so that's like, mm-hmm makes you like you can sprint and it'll be safe right like it's it's like you've cleared it out whereas another game just still sneaking around just makes it a lot more approachable i think but yeah that was great um boss fights fantastic stuff um you know there's not too many of them but they're kind of sprinkled at nice little places throughout the game um they're all creepy and interesting and and uh you know really fit the tone of the game i think the bosses like the the story of this game overall is like it's not really that intense you know like there's some narrative there's some dialogue but it's not like it's not like the last of us or god of war or these games that are really mm-hmm. story focused like the story is really just the reason to move you from the next point to the next point to get you to to travel and see what the crazy things that you're going to experience on the way are but the bosses right. themselves like they're they are like really creepy and disgusting people <laughs> and like you know they're creatures that come out and they have weak points and they all have kind of an, their own trick to them and interesting arenas you kind of have to move around so so those were fun um and they i think they really test your weaponry as well like i had a few really specific strategies that i i had used on a couple of these bosses like okay i've got my rifle here it's got this long range scope i can use it at the start of this battle to like pick off these things in the distance or like hit this boss's weak point but if i didn't have that rifle like to do that kind of damage you'd have to play it a lot differently um so like i was talking to a friend of mine that had also been playing the game who liked to use a lot of different weapons or like for one of the bosses i had a rocket launcher which does you know a ton of damage they didn't have it so it's like well what did the what did that fight look like for you pretty interesting considering you know you wouldn't expect this game to have a lot of variety in how you would tackle situations but it's a lot more flexible than i think you would anticipate on first glance um which is good because the way the game is set up too is now that i finished it you they, at the end of the game it kind of gives you like a rating on like i got a b i think overall for how well i did in the game mm-hmm. and it gives you a rating it gives you like a time stamp it gives you like your accuracy your score because it's really set up i think for people that want to do like multiple run throughs or play new game plus and so you can kind of like go for that improvement on your run and at the same time you might want to try like a different weapon set or try like Um, you know, some different attachments for your guns or leveling up different things. Um, So it's got the replay factor. I don't know if I'll personally go for that right now. Like, um, you know, we're not typically the type to do it, but it's just cool they put that kind of level of of extras in it as well. That's interesting. That's interesting because I think it's like definitely one of those games I think the average person is going to play it more for like the spectacle of like going through all the set pieces and seeing all the bosses and all like the crazy monsters you end up fighting. Um, Because I think it's definitely one of those series that's known for just sort of like you know, like almost like one upping itself in terms of like what kind of weird, crazy shit am I going to run into mm-hmm. like around this corner? Um, but yeah, there is some interesting level of like 
I, I want to say like RPG mechanics, but kind of is with like the different guns and like all the different upgrades that you can put on them. And like, there is an amount of customization in the game that is surprising based on like what you would assume at a first glance if you've never played a Resident Evil game. Like, I remember that surprising me with Village a lot of being like, oh, I don't just like, this isn't just my pistol. It's, it's the pistol, but like, I go to the bench and here's like 20 things I can do to the pistol to change it. Or I just cannot use it at all and use something else. And like, mm -hmm. I was yeah. surprised at that because typically horror games, you're, you are like very restricted in terms of like, here's the, you know, the gun that has a lot of ammo that you're going to use that sucks most of the time. And then save your two like good shotgun bullets for when you really need them, you idiot. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I started using a Magnum near the end of the game. <clears throat> And it was just mm -hmm. a weapon type that I'd never really put any time into. But I was carrying a weapon that I just hadn't really been able to use a lot. And I was like, oh, screw it. So I just sold it and like bought a Magnum. And then I bought this thing and I'm like, oh, my God, I should have been using this the whole time. It's just like, bam, like one shot does so much damage. It was fantastic. I feel like that was the game in Village that I liked the most, if I remember correctly, was the Magnum. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but like the, the loadouts really do make a lot of difference, too. And, and something I really want to emphasize about this game is just how... As you go through and I've, as I've played some level, some of the sections a couple times, you know, from dying or whatever, that I just think the the level design in this game is so immaculate. It is, you know, I think it's on a level with the best kind of action games that we've seen, like whether we talk about The Last of Us or I know. Um, I don't know if I, a Souls is a good comparison just because they're so open and like the way that the maps kind of connect is a little different than something like mm -hmm. this. But I think it's just so smart in the way that it, it leads you around and like you know, you'll go through a passageway and there'll be a locked door. But later, once you get to the next objective, it'll like conveniently open to take you exactly back to where you need or like on a different level too. like we were talking about last time, there's the bell you can shoot and like ring to, to take advantage of that situation. There's been so many times where I've, you know, entered there's some there's some kind of, you know, I'd say four or five big sections where you're in kind of quite a large combat arena in this game with like multiple levels. And there's like, you know, you can you can really go to the top and if you have a rifle, you can kind of scope down or like, you know, you can sneak through little tunnels or over bridges. There's like a lot of variety. And I've just I've just noticed like when you take your time and sort of really observe your surroundings in this game. And if you especially if you have a scope on one of your weapons, you can kind of look around and be like, OK, well, I can shoot that explosive thing up there and that'll take out those two snipers. And then there's the guy with the rocket launcher. I know he's over there. So if I just get over to this bridge, I can see him and shoot him in the head before he like they all notice mm -hmm. where I am. And you can kind of manipulate the situation like that in this game or like you know as you get there's certain other things placed in different areas where once you know they're there you can make something that seems really hard at first you can kind of sneak around and go like the back way and all of a sudden kill like three people from behind through stealth and it makes it way easier but it's just that familiarity you get as you continue mm -hmm. to play um i just think it's so smart and i can totally see how like on a second playthrough i would be instantly so much faster through the game or like know what I'm doing just because of that, that like uh, the way that you get to learn how to, to control like these situations to your favor, uh, awesome. which I love. I, I think, I think whenever I hear anyone describe something like that, it really like shows to me that like linear games are good. And like mm -hmm. they, like sometimes that can be such a benefit because like you can be intentional about knowing how a player like has to approach an area or a situation like you know they're coming from this door you know exactly like how you can plan out what's going to be inside it and like linear is not it linear doesn't mean that the player doesn't have agency or that you don't make a lot of like critical decisions on the fly or that you can't approach a situation in like a lot of different ways it just means that like you know, you're you're going through it in a certain set order and that things can be like tailored to know like, okay, enemy placements exactly where this is because like you have to approach it from this angle. But then once you're in the situation, there's tons of little like micro adjustments that could mm -hmm. happen. And like, there's so many different ways it plays out based on what you do, like what gear you have. And like, I just think that this sounds like such a thoughtful, um, like meticulous, like to detail kind of like construction of a world, right? Like if it's down to like, you know, it's so seamless, like where each enemy is placed with thought and care. It isn't just like, oh, we need like, you know, 10 dogs to be in this area because you got to mm -hmm. fight dogs here. <laughs> like, yeah, 100 so, percent. And like one of the best. It's such a glowing recommendation for a game. <laughs> it is. And and I want to just highlight kind of like one of my favorite levels of the game is the last thing I talk about. 
um, mm-hmm. just because I think it's so smart and it really illustrates what you're saying. There's this area called the clock tower. It's maybe halfway through the game. And um, it's my favorite area that I went through. Obviously, <laughs> I went through all the areas, but uh, it's kind of like you're at one point, you're kind of climbing up this clock tower and it's got this sort of spiral staircase. And um, so in, and in the center, there's like this spinning flamethrower thing. And so you have to like time when you're running around the outside with like not getting burned, basically. Mm-hmm. But then to add on to it, as you ca- kind of get, you know, partway through, they also start rolling. There's this this asshole at the top of the thing and he's pulling this lever and these giant spiky Indiana Jones type balls start rolling down the <laughs> stairs. So you have to avoid both of these obstacles <laughs> yes. at once. Um, and there's also like enemies on, you know, all the way up the stairs as well, trying to fight you. And so there's like every once in a while, there's these little pull offs you can kind of, you know, squeeze into, mm-hmm. you can avoid the ball or like get out of the way of the fire and whatnot. And so I died there, you know, a couple of times just kind of getting the timing down but once I got to to know it, you know, I didn't even fight the enemies. I kind of just led them into the obstacles. And then once you like get a certain amount of way up the, you know, you, you can lead them back into the fire. They'll all run into it because they're stupid zombies and I can avoid it. So you fight your way up. You finally get to the top. And then I take out the guy on the lever and I'm like, okay, finally, now I can like go back and get a few treasure boxes that were along the way that I didn't have time to open while he was rolling these things at me. So I go back, I'm like opening, I'm looting a few things that I found. And I notice at the bottom of the stairs, there's like more guys running up. And I think to myself, okay, instead of waiting to fight these guys, I'm just going to go up and I'm going to pull that lever. So now I start (laughs) rolling these balls down at the enemies and I'm like totally able to defend myself just using the stage while I'm busy picking up all these things and like arranging my stuff and just figuring out what I want to do. And I just thought that was like, it's not the most ingenious thing to think of to go and use that, but I just think it's so cool that um, the game is clearly like wanting you to do that. And it, even mm-hmm. though like, it's not like it didn't take a genius to figure it out. Like it just feels like it's so good to get that kind of one up on a game where you're like, ha ha, like it's mine now. Like I've done this. Yeah. And uh, I, that, I love that feeling. That sounds incredible. Like, yeah, like it's not like the most complex, it's not like you do some like complex geometry to figure that out, but like it does feel so satisfying when there's like something in the game like that. And like, realistically, like if he was pulling the lever for boulders, like why couldn't you? But a lot of games wouldn't let you Mm -hmm. have that. It would just be an inactive lever, right? Like you don't have, you wouldn't do anything. Yeah, exactly. A lot of games it's like, Oh, that's just like an obstacle that you overcame. And like, now you're done with that puzzle. But like, it is so incredibly satisfying when there's that like internal logic to a game where it's like, well, maybe I'm going to do it. And then it, and then it actually works. Like Mm -hmm. even if you kind of expect it to work, I still feel like it's always like got a little bit of a surprise that it actually does. And then you're just delighted. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. That's awesome. So yeah, I I don't know what else I can say. Like, I guess you could nitpick here and there. I would have loved some, a little bit of, better checkpointing at certain places i do find like we were talking last time like it's sort of endearing how they held on to some of the stuff from the the first version like this the cheesy corny like nothing dialogue is funny um although i wish ashley had a little bit more agency she's just like a helpless woman in this game and it's totally like i'm leon i'm a guy i'll help you you know i wish I'm i wish we- they I'm like wearing my sport sunglasses yeah, like, I'm yeah. i got i got girl. ashley a pair of glasses too actually i want to let you Are know she? she i halfway through i unlocked this like red pair of ray-bans she looked hilarious as well nice. Um, (laughs) so there's there's those things I do feel like the checkpointing could have been um, I don't know if it was like the same checkpoints as in the first game or whatnot but there was a couple sections where you know I went through the better part of 20 minutes of like taking all these people out systematically in an area and then like I died at the end to something stupid and had to go back I just feel Mm -hmm. like we could have done better there like it's and especially in a horror game too because once you've gone around and you've seen like what's in the in the room you know like it's not scary anymore it's just meticulous and yeah. it's not great. So, I mean, could that be improved? Sure. But this game really can't be improved in too many spots, honestly. Like, it is great. Um, okay. You have to play it at some point. That's all I can say. I I am so interested in playing this game. Like, it is it is bumped high up my list. So, yeah. Um, yeah. definitely, like, this will not be the last we hear of Resident Evil 4. Because at some point in the near future, <laughs> I am sure I'll be talking about it. Um, yeah. I have one more question for yeah. you before we move on. And that is... Aside from Ashley as a character, like, what did you think of her mechanically as, like, a um, character that you need to protect? Mm. Because, like, this game sometimes gets, like, joked on as, like, oh, it's the ultimate, like, um, oh, what, what's the word? I'm saw like, I'm escort word now. mission. Escort es- mission. Yeah, it's the ultimate escort mission because it's the whole game. So, like, was Ashley, like, 
was that kind of annoying at times or does it actually work pretty well with being able to command her where to go or like you know no. how, how much like in peril is she at all times yeah there's you know like it's interesting when she's with you like as a companion and you can kind of do the like follow me close or stay back kind of thing I really had almost no issue keeping her safe at any time because mm. I just felt like I kept her close to me and I'm I I got like really good. I felt at my positioning where I'd always be like in a good spot and she was so close to me that it didn't really matter as long as I mm -hmm. was smart about like taking out the right enemies. The parts that made it that were harder was there's a few parts where like um she has to like unlock a door or something and you have to defend her in one spot or like she's in right. uh, she's like holding a there's some doors where like you have to hold a lever and like if you let go it'll close so she has to stand there and hold it open while you go and like do something and like while she's there oftentimes like well she's a stationary target that has to stay in one spot it can be a pain in the ass because they'll come and try and get her while you're off like trying to do something in the other part of the room so you're kind of like going back and forth that's a bit of a pain and those were probably some of my least favorite encounters but it's it's honestly not that much and there's you get kind of separated from her and brought back and then you know like it's not often you have to deal with it so I would say that if there was more of it I might have not liked it but I think for the amount that it's in there it's fine. Okay that's fair and I think even for the sections like the sections where you command her she's close to you like do you think mm -hmm. it kind of almost like is a benefit because it adds like an extra tension of like something you have to worry about yeah during combat like i could see that maybe being a positive in definitely some ways too. I, I like the way they did it because you're not like what what i hate about those kind of missions in other games is like the second you get into a combat you're like oh my god this person is so fucked like all i have to do is watch them and like I, they're like my main priority in this game like i feel as though the zombies are still overall more concerned with you because okay. they're coming for you overall and that it just happens if like some of them will go for her but I don't know they, they just didn't seem to down her that often and then mm -hmm. when she does get down it gets tense though because if she gets hit again when she's down it's game over for you like she doesn't have a health right. bar or something she just has like two kind of hits I guess mm -hmm. and so that can cause some stress but yeah no, overall it's like not annoying I don't I wouldn't complain about it a bit really I would complain more about her the way she's characterized um, right you know uh, that that to me is not great but but um yeah the mechanics are fine okay um, awesome yeah. Well, yeah, yeah yeah then you have answered all my questions very satisfactorily <laughs> uh, and i i yeah resident evil 4 is in my future i'm excited and scared <laughs> awesome. it should be in everyone else's future as well but uh mm -hmm. okay well let's talk about something else i know nothing about moon scars kate so why don't you enlighten me and the rest of the audience about <laughs> this delightful game that i assume is somewhat of a 2d souls like that's exactly what it is. Moonscars is one of the like you know thirty seven thousand two D Souls like <laughs> games. Um, but I I came across it. What initially got me interested in this game over a lot oh. of other options was that I just loved the art style. I found it really interesting and really unique. Mm. Um, so for anyone who's uh, watching on YouTube, we've got just some gameplay going. If um, someone just kind of we do thank you thank you credit sections. all credit to the collector's hubs on youtube mm -hmm. for this, uh, this footage. yeah so we've got some gameplay going and you can see like it's got a very kind of like i would say like a painted sort of style it's like, like it's painted really, pixel art it's kind of cool yeah like it's really gorgeous and it's got a really interesting like color scheme like i would say like a lot of the areas are kind of like dark like almost like grayscale a lot of like really muted colors but then your main character is dressed like in red and then whenever you kill an enemy they like they get like a bit of a blood splatter that is also red and it stands out really striking against the really dark browns um so yeah this game is gorgeous and that was the first kind of thing and then it was on game pass and i was like okay i gotta check it mm. out and then I read some reviews and the reviews are very polarizing. Like a lot of reviews are like, this game's great, loved it, had a great time. And other reviews are like, this game is terrible. It has a lot of ideas that don't work. <laughs> it's always interesting to go into a game when that's kind of the pitch, I find. Yeah, and, and that uh, that almost intrigued me just as much to try it because I, I think there's a lot of i wouldn't be unfair to say there's a lot of saturation in this genre now especially i find with the 2d ones like there's a lot of games that are you know this kind of souls inspired you lose your stuff on death and there's hard boss fights and you know you get like to choose which weapon you want and um they're kind of like mm -hmm. dark fantasy sort of style and a lot of them end up feeling very similar 
Um, but this game for, for, you know, the faults it may have, I think it does a lot of things that are unique, which I appreciate because I think like, it's nice to have something that isn't just going through the same path. It's kind of trying to like carve its own identity and whether or not that works perfectly all of the time, I think I at least respect that they like had some creative ideas and I would be really interested to see like a game number two that maybe kind of like perfected them a little bit. Mm. So, so does um, this game have Metroidvania elements to it then? Or like, how does the, what's the format? I, I would say it's like very light Metroidvania. Like you do kind of go through different areas and there are definitely like some spots where it's like, okay, you, you have to be able to like, um, there's like a big dash you get that you can go over gaps. So you can find them and you don't know how to progress this area. So you've got to go and like find somewhere else to go until you get the upgrade and you can come back and do the dash. So it's got a couple of those. I would say it's very light though. It's like two or maybe three upgrades that you can consider like needing to traverse the world um but for the most part it's kind of just it's more about it's definitely more about the combat than platforming although i would say it, it, she's quite a satisfying character to move especially when you get a double dash because then mario you kart do, double like, dash shout quick. out everybody mario kart double <laughs> yeah you get another character that just kind of follows around throws, <laughs> throws shells at the back punches people um, from behind punches people yeah um so the kind of the, the gimmick of this game is that you start out, you just have a sword, you have like a basic attack, and then you have two like spell slots is how I would describe them. And the spell slots are what you kind of spend your currency on. So the soul of this game, you could say that you kill monsters and you get get spent on like buying new spells from a skill tree. So you don't actually do stats, you just keep buying more powerful versions of spells and it was kind of interesting that you could like pick and choose which mm. spells you want to prioritize like where you want to go in on the tree like i think by the end of the game i basically had everything so like it's not super extensive but it was at least like a bit of you know choice on how you kind of want to approach it and the spells are neat because they kind of borrow the same sort of ideas like hollow knight in that um you have your health bar and then you have a essentially like a mana bar it's not what it's called but you could call it that uh it's called like spite i think your oh no spite. it's icker sorry icker, icker is the, okay. uh, the the currency and icker is kind of like a life force i guess is how it would be described so you can hold down your heal button you don't have flask like is traditional in these games like a set amount of heals the bar heals you so you hold the but the healing button down and you kind of have to stand still and it heals you and drains your Icker bar. But Icker <laughs> it just is sounds also made the... up. It heals you and drains <laughs> your Icker bar. bar. It kind of sounds like like a protein snack. As yeah. Well. Like, try this Icker bar. You guys bar, want to go meet like... up at the Icker bar? <laughs> yeah, peak performance. Um, so that's interesting. But it, it's kind of like a risk reward because your Icker is also how you cast spells. It's the currency. Each spell casts a certain amount. So spells are very powerful and it's what you're using to like upgrade yourself as you go through. But also if you like just go into the start of a fight and pop the bar, then you might not be able to heal for a little bit. Right. So but if, but if like you're a, a veteran player, you're very good at the game. You can really be like super aggro then not need to heal and be like very offensive. Yeah. Yeah, you probably could be. And um, the way that Icker is refilled is when you hit enemies. Mm. So you're you're really incentivized to be aggressive, but at the same time, like that's your health resource as well. So it's this really nice balance of like, you know, you go in, you're fighting a bit and then you take some damage. You're like, oh, fuck, I've got to heal. But like you don't have Icker, so you have to go back in to mm -hmm. fight them a bit more to have the capability to heal. So yeah, but it's the same. It's the exact same system that's in Hollow Knight. Um, it's in, and I, I there's something it similar there. we were talking here. about in um, Death's Door too, right? Like you, Death's Door is also similar. Is, um, yeah. But it's not your health though. It's a little bit more forgiving in Death's Door, isn't it? Like your in Death's Door, it's just for um, the the way spells work. It doesn't that's have right, the just whole sprinkle onto it. It's yeah, just not for quite as quite detrimental to not yeah, have those. But yeah. like, I gotta say, like, I love this system. I think it's so neat because it's such a, like, good risk reward. Like, you can be really defensive and always have healing, or you can be aggressive, but then, you know, you're losing a potential resource, but then, you know, you have to keep fighting to get it back. And it also allows you to, like, 
traverse an area for a long time. Like you can always kind of stay topped up on all your resources. You don't have to worry about like, oh, I've only got two health pots left. Like I better, you know, go back to the safe spot and like refill. You just are constantly like progressing forward until you die. Mm -hmm. So I love that system. I think it's fantastic. Uh, it also has a really neat lore implication. Um, I don't get too much in the story of these games because it's definitely taking the from soft approach of being kind of vague and like, you know, kind of like ethereal of a story, but it's got a really interesting one where like a lot of the beings in this world are actually like clones made of clay and they're kind of sort of like a hive mind sort of like kind of idea, but then characters are sort of like, you know, gaining some humanity. And then there's the question of like every time they make another clay version of this, they become like the real one. But then the other one's just hmm. sort of there as like a husk. And it's like, well, who, what's, you know, which one really is the person? Like, are they all wow. versions of them? Or are they all different? Like it, it actually has quite an interesting narrative if you choose to engage with it, which I think you definitely don't have to to enjoy this game. Like it can just be a fun combat game, but it's I so was interesting that, that that's the story <laughs> because I was watching Ghost in the Shell last night and that's like mm -hmm. very similar <laughs> to what you were just interesting. saying. Interesting. I haven't seen Ghost in the Shell despite it being like recommended a lot of times, but I should because I'm yeah. I'm such a sucker. Any kind of story that like questions like what exactly humanity is and like what makes you human and like, you know, like a Detroit kind of story. Yeah. Like I'm such a massive sucker for that. I like so. that stuff too. And you should definitely watch Ghost in the Shell in that case because that's like, mm -hmm. that's like the theme of the show. <laughs> that's what it's about. <laughs> yeah, I mean the name that makes sense, Ghost in the Shell. Like that's a badass name by the it way. Is. It's um, one of the top names so for anything of all time. I completely agree. Like it's it's got to be a metal band out there somewhere <laughs> as well. Um, that's dope. But anyway, yeah, so this game, so those are kind of the interesting hooks of it. Um, then it's got a few, I'll kind of go over the mechanics. I think like if anyone's seen a 2D like action souls game, like, you know, you've got your attacks, you've got a parry. The parry's very nice in this game, I will say. So big points on that one. It's very clearly displayed what moves you can parry. They have this like red pulse that goes out of them when the move starts. So I really appreciate that because it takes the guesswork out of like, can I parry this move? And then you try and you don't get it. And you're like, did I just do it wrong? Or like, does yeah, it yeah, not yeah. work? Where it's so clear, which is good because the game is, is hard. Like th that is the sticking point I would say to not recommend to a lot of people is the game is pretty difficult and it's pretty punishing when it gets hard. So I think unless you are down to like, fight bosses a mm -hmm. decent amount of times it's not really for everybody and um, so like how did you personally enjoy that level for this game i personally liked it i i thought it was like a good level for me personally um but it has an interesting mechanic that it does alleviate this potential problem a little bit in the fact that as you progress to the game and the more things you kill the moon phase changes and it gets like this to be this like red blood moon and as the moon gets bloodier enemies start to deal more damage but you also start to deal more damage so fights become very um difficult in the sense of like you can only really take one or two hits and then you're dead but you're also killing enemies quicker. So you kind of get like a bit of a power fantasy at that stage, but it raises the tension as well. So there were times where I was playing where I was like running through things and I was feeling so good about myself. And I was just felt like, you know, like an absolute God. And then I would come across like an encounter and just get my ass absolutely handed to me. And I would go, okay, I'm done at that moon phase now. Let's make it go down. So you get an item that um, resets it back to just regular. Um, and then as you keep going, it'll progress up and up and up again. And then you can keep resetting it with this item. Um, and so it worked for me because I, you know, went through the game at a pretty decent pace, but the item is finite is the catch. So if you're not as confident in these types of games or you're finding it more difficult and you are like dying more and then, having that moon cycle kind of like progressing, you could potentially run out of the resource. And I think that would be really awful. 
Like, I think that should just be something you should be able to do because it's going to alienate a lot of people who want to play the game, but want to play at the lower moon and don't want to yeah. have to deal with it, like, rising. Yeah, and it's funny because those are the people that are going to run out because they're going to be using it more. Mm -hmm. And so it's like a exactly. self-fulfilling prophecy of, diff of like... Yeah. Exactly. So I, I think if it's, like, you know, either it's not optional or it is, and, like, this middle ground worked fine for me because I always had the resource available when I wanted it, and I got to be able to choose when it was low versus when it was high, and that, I think, is what they intend for you to do. Like, they want you to try to play it higher and then reset it when it's becoming a bit too overwhelming, but the problem is is that if you find the game just difficult in general, which it's, it is, it's not an easy game, you could run out and then be halfway through the game and be like basically fucked because you don't have the ability to reset it. So mm -hmm, I think mm -hmm. it would just be a better game if there, that option was like, you know, something you could turn on to say like infinite reset. Sure. Yeah, the yeah, moon phase, yeah. Right. Like, I don't think that hurts anyone. You can still have it be a finite resource if you want the tension or, you know. Yeah, it wouldn't really change much. Eh? Hmm. Exactly. So I, that's what I would say is probably my biggest complaint of the game. Um, they've got a couple other interesting things they do that I want to shout out just to show how unique this game is. And I think its biggest strength is its world design um, and the kind of creativity that they're approaching it with. So you've got that moon. You've also got a kind of like people call it a roguelike element, which I guess is interesting. It's called your spite level. So as you kill things, you have a bar that fills up. And when it fills up, you get to open the spite menu which they just opened how wonderfully timed uh, and you get to choose a little perk so that could be like you heal a little bit more when you're healing um your like crit chance goes up like your spells cost a little bit less like stuff like that they're small perks but they add up and you get to keep accumulating these as you're killing enemies but when you die you lose all of your spite perks and then you have to start like perking yeah, up again. Yeah, okay. So that kind of is like roguelike -y then. So I guess like the so longer you live, the longer you live, you get power just for that life within the game. So it's kind of exactly. like a roguelike within a game that's not a roguelike. That's exactly. cool, actually. It was that's like cool. a roguelike mechanic in a game that is not because like your progress, you know, like you're still progressing through it. Like it's not like you're doing runs. You are progressing through like the set levels. But I kind of hit and miss on this. I think this is probably the game's most like contentious um mechanic because on one hand i really like it like it's really fun to be accumulating them as you go especially when you're just exploring an area but the downside is that when you're doing a boss <laughs> you just kind of you show up you've got all your spite things you fight the boss you die because the boss is hard and you haven't learned what all their moves are yet and then you go back up to them and you're like i have no spite like levels like maybe you get one on the way because like there's usually a few enemies on your way to the boss from the mirror which are these games bonfires so maybe you get one but like you're kind of feeling a little bit like weaker than you normally would be because you're used to having accumulated a few so your options are either keep fighting the boss without any spite or go and grind and then come back and fight the boss after which like to me, that just sounds really tedious. So I ended yeah, up just fighting yeah. them like at base strength because I didn't want to waste my time. Yeah, and what are you gonna and, do? Like, like accumulate more? Okay, I've practiced this boss for half an hour. Now I'm feeling I'm gonna go for a good run. So I'm gonna go grind for some spite for 20 minutes and then challenge the boss and hope I don't die. And then like you know, yeah, yeah I know what you mean. Like it just, I think it's one of those things where like it was a neat idea, and I really love how it works when you're. Ex exploring an area because like you do just build it up and then if you die like whatever there's so so much more of the area to explore so like you just feel like it's constantly like happening and it's really nice too because it kind of works with the moon phase so like as the moon is rising you are also getting more spite so you're also getting stronger to like keep pace with that a little bit but and then it just kind of all falls apart at the bosses because it's like, well, I'll just ignore this mechanic, but it sort of feels like it's supposed to be like a choice. Like, is it worth it to go, you know, like kill stuff on the way and farm it up? But it's, well, it's not really worth it because it's just tedious, right? Like it stops being a decision of, is this like a, a smart strategy and just becomes, do I want to waste five minutes 
at the start of every boss yeah. fight, which this the answer is, is no. <laughs> yeah, this is how this this is exactly how I feel about my biggest complaint about the number eleven game on my list, which I beloved and love so much, Bloodborne. Mm -hmm. Why the fuck don't they just start with max blood vials every time? <laughs> yes. It's such bullshit that you have to go and farm those. Like, 100%. oh my god, what a hundred percent. Blood vial farming is by far the worst part of Bloodborne. And like, again, it just Horrible. goes back to the same argument of like, it doesn't make the game more difficult. It just yeah, makes it, it just more, wastes your time. It just either wastes your time or makes it more inaccessible for people who like are going to die more. Yeah, like, like me. Because when I had to go fight the cleric beast for the first time playing <laughs> the game, it wasn't just run to the cleric beast. It was first farm enough blood vial so I don't die yeah. in two seconds to the cleric beast. And then go fight him to learn his moves to die and then have to farm more blood vial. Like, oh my god. Yeah. What a nightmare. It, it's something that, like, on in theory seems like it could be an interesting mechanic. Because, like, oh, it adds a level of, like, tension. But it just it just makes it tedious. It doesn't work. So, um, yeah. The tension yeah, comes from running out of blood vials in a fight. Not from having to farm them <laughs> mundanely exactly. in between. I, yeah. I agree Anyways, 100%. Anyways, we're on a tangent. I agree. Yeah. Anyway, as someone with a Bloodborne tattoo, I agree. That's a shitty part of Bloodborne. That's like the only part. That's like the only part. It's horrible. <laughs> yeah, everything else, 10 out of 10. Blood Vile Farming, 0 out of 10. Um, but yeah, I would say Moonscars was a really neat experience. It kind of, um, it felt really fresh, I think, in a space where I fucking love Souls-like games. So like, I will play basically, I want to play basically all of them. They're all on my list. But it does feel refreshing to get something that has a bit more of a unique identity or at least is trying out some new ideas and they don't always work perfectly but I think for the most part I enjoyed a lot of the mechanics um and I guess there's one last one I'll just briefly say like you you get like a special attack that you keep getting to choose and so you've got one where like you do like a big whirlwind and it applies like a damage over time you've got one where you kind of throw the spear out and it comes back to you and it like slows enemies or something so they all kind of do something a little bit different but you keep getting to change them as you go so i like that for just having a bit of variety like i don't typically do like tons of different builds in these kind of games like i kind of just do the same thing every game because i like what i like but having to get a having a little bit of like you know every like 40 minutes or so i got to choose a different ability to use was kind of fun it just kept it a little bit more varied and it was like oh cool like i've never tried the big axe out i'll try the big axe which normally in a game i would never try the big axe because it sounds big and slow <laughs> and then i got it and i was like i don't like it <laughs> but i was <laughs> surprise, glad i tried it. um but yeah i would say if you if you like these like games and you're down for something that's going to be a bit more demanding of a challenge um but actually has a really interesting story and, and just is a little bit different i 100 percent recommend moon scars if you like the genre but are not the biggest fan of it and think that you might you know not have the patience for something a little bit more abrasive i would say maybe no but at least google the game just to see how pretty it is <laughs> Um, and then yeah. don't, you don't have to buy it. It's also on Game Pass, so, you know. Yeah, check it out on Game Pass, I me. Mean, come on. Yeah. Uh, that's awesome. You know, okay, first of all, one yeah. thing. Uh, sorry if you if anyone can hear the piano going on on my side. Uh, my ah. upstairs neighbor is playing the piano. She is very a very good pianist, but not exactly the greatest for podcasting, mm -hmm. so apologies there. Well, I can't hear the piano, okay. so hopefully yeah. that means everyone else can't. But also, if everyone can and I can't, I feel a little left out because <laughs> her piano is lovely. <laughs> that's right, yeah. <laughs> Um, the other thing I was going to say was I'm, I'm really glad every time we talk about one of these games, I'm usually quite fascinated to hear you break it apart because on face value, they all look so similar to me. Um, you know, just like what I'm looking mm -hmm. at here. I couldn't have told you these intricacies, but I do think the <laughs> pixel art is pretty cool on this one mm -hmm. for the character. I don't know about the environment, to be totally honest. It's just so dark and like you can't really oh. see a lot. I don't know. But this is just this I environment, everyone. too. I, I will say um, that I think the quality on YouTube isn't as nice as actually playing it. So I think when you That's play it, sure. it is not quite sure. so dark. Um, and it's, yeah, it's just gorgeous. Like, there's yeah. one area in particular where it actually is kind of black and white and everything just, like, pops. It's, yeah, it's lovely. Awesome. All right, well, let's change gears a little bit here and let's talk about Nintendo Indie World. Uh, which happened a couple of days ago, and there was a ton of different announcements from lovely, uh, you know, Nintendo indie publishers. And we're just going to talk about our, some of our favorite stuff from the show because there was quite a lot of stuff announced. I've got a little video of it playing here. We'll just have it in the background. Um, so where do you want to start, Kate? Like, what stuck out to you here? How'd you enjoy the show? 
Uh, I mean, I loved it. I don't think I can ever watch a, like, indie showcase and not love it. Like, I can't say there's, like, tons of games for me, but I just think it's, like, delightful to watch all these kind of, like, cute and creative games come out. Um, I guess if I wanted to shout one out, I mean, I, I got it. Like, I'll just go for, like, the low-hanging fruit for me. Like, Blasphemous 2 is coming mm-hmm. out. Like, mm-hmm. as I just talked about at length, it's another 2D Souls-like game. I haven't actually <laughs> played the first Blasphemous but it's one on the list and so i think maybe with the sequel that i definitely want to check the first one out and I, i've heard really good things so exciting to get a, a follow-up game yeah for sure i think the number one for me and it's and you know what's funny is like this is i agree like this indie world is definitely one where i wouldn't say there's anything that's like wow i have to get this a lot of mm-hmm. times there's at least there's usually at least one or two indies where i'm like wow this is really awesome i was mm-hmm. really hoping to see plucky squire to be honest like that's what was, oh my god um, that game looks so fucking good yeah. i want to play plucky squire so the badly. same here that's like oh man yeah we'll have to do an episode to talk about our uh you know most anticipated mm-hmm. for the rest of the year or something um we've been on a lot of sidetracks this episode this has been good this mm-hmm. has been a good episode um what i was gonna say my my thing that stood out to me was crime o'clock uh coming out june later yes. in june this year yes. now this game it instantly stuck out because of the visuals it looks like where's waldo like there's it's <laughs> yes, like it a does. i guess you're like you're a detective and you're kind of piecing together what happened but it seemed to me like my impression was you're kind of looking around in these like really where's waldo like complicated zoomed out really hustle and bustle filled in pictures and you're like seeing where crimes happened but then the cool thing is is that you're flipping through time as well and like different things are happening in different times and as you uncover what happened at one time it'll affect like something in the future in the past um i just love the presentation i love like the black and white with the really vibrant colors um who knows if it's going to be any good but it definitely stuck out to me as something i would love to try yeah or love to look into Um hundred percent. I think this looks really neat. I think it really comes down to like, yeah, like you said, the execution, but I think the idea is fantastic. The presentation looks good. Like it's definitely a game to, to keep my eye on for sure. Um, another game I want to shout out is actually Oxen Free 2, The Lost mm. Signal. Did you play the first one? I did play the first one. Because I played so, the first one too. Okay. So yeah. I played Oxen Free. I bought it on my Switch. I was homesick one day. I was really sick. <laughs> I was in <laughs> home. I had to stay home from work. And I was like wanting to play a game, but I was like, oh, all these games I have are like, they're too much effort. Like I just can't be bothered. And so I ended up just like on a whim buying Oxen Free from the Nintendo eShop. And I really enjoyed it mm. like more than I I thought I was going to. Like it's, it's kind of a neat like paranormal game story um but it plays with time in a really interesting way and like there's almost parts of the game where you get stuck in a time loop um Mm -hmm. and and it has like you know the characters are just sort of endearing as well like i ended up buying into the relationship of like the young girl who's there with like a friend and you know they're kind of in that like growing up process of like moving away or like what they're gonna do with the rest of their lives so they're they're sort of just like a a really grounded story going on at the same time as you're getting like creepy paranormal haunted. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's interesting um, that you that you feel that way. For me, oxen free, like everything you're saying about it is true, and that is the way it is. Mm-hmm. But for some reason, it didn't land with me the same way. Like I felt like there was, I think I got lost a few times, and I found myself mm-hmm. kind of wandering the island, and it just kind of took me out of it a bit and I think the other thing was I took a bit of a break in between when I was playing it so I maybe wasn't Mm. as familiar with the story which isn't the game's fault that's my fault but um I know like the game is really well received by most people I think so I'm glad you're excited for the second one I I mean I liked it like I feel like it's a game I wouldn't normally like necessarily go for but whatever it was like it was a combination when I played it like I think I went through it like in it like two days like being home from sick just like played like a lot during one day, like went to bed, like got up, still felt like shit. It was like, all right, I'm gonna finish off some mm-hmm, break. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I I think two looks good. Um, I'm I'm interested in playing it. Like, I might just you know wait for a rainy day. Like the next time I get sick, <laughs> so, so yeah. I'll buy yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Um, kind of keep the the oxen free tradition. Hey, going. you know, uh, Night School Studios, the studio that makes that, is a Netflix studio. So there's potential oh, we might get that game on the Netflix app. Uh, for free that would be neat it would also know. make a really good show i think if netflix wanted to it would. take it down that yeah, avenue it would. they could totally like stranger vibes uh, stranger things it up and yeah have some kids 100%. On an island or it something. has a yeah. really stranger thing vibe that's a good comparison yeah. to make uh okay so the game i want to talk about and like 
cross your fingers, everybody, because this is really like this is a zero out of ten game, or it could be like a ten out of ten fun time. <laughs> this is played up. This is basically oh overcooked, but you're running the whole restaurant. <laughs> yeah. I mean, who knows? Because this game, like, it could just be total garbage. Like, some of these games just end up not being good at all. But if this thing mm-hmm. is executed well and it's really overcooked, but you're also serving people, like, we have to play this game. And it's a roguelike. <laughs> and you're like, as you're going, you're like yeah. serving and unlocking things. I can just envision it now. Like, it's you, it's me, it's two other friends. It's like, okay, Kate, you're running the kitchen. I'm running the front of house. And then someone's over here yeah. doing the dishes. Someone's here. Oh, what upgrade are we taking? Oh, we're buying new ovens for our fridge or <laughs> ovens for our kitchen because we're going to like, you know, it would just be so much fun to play that. I think we'd have a blast if it A hundred percent. Like you cannot get the elephant in the room comparison. Like this is just overcooked, but they've like changed the format, mm. which like, I guess that's yeah. kind of shitty in but some ways. In other ways, it's like, that's what I want. <laughs> yeah, Overcooked as a roguelike is genius. As long as it's, it's got like so interesting smart. things to unlock and, and whatnot, you know? Yeah, it reminds me of like if you took Overcooked and like Diner Dash mm-hmm. and put them together and yeah. like this and made game it made me really want to play Diner Dash, which is, which is like a game I have not thought about <laughs> in many years. Shout out to like, Diner it took, Dash. Shout out to Diner Dash in the days I used to download the free trial, like, 20 oh times in that, a row to play like for an evening <laughs> it was that an insane aquarium we never had yeah, the full versions. Right. we just played the demos over and over for hours <laughs> <That's right. laughs> um i fucking loved that game like i want to see a revival awesome. of that but like yeah played it up looks played up which is a great name for it looks mm-hmm. like it could be phenomenal and at the very least like i feel like even if it's not good like it's one night of like having oh yeah, yeah. And having yeah. Fun it just regardless, can't be bad so. it just can't be bad yeah that's all mm-hmm. that's all yeah um that's a neat pick uh i want to shout out just very briefly call to the lamb getting yeah. um an update it's got some it's got some like different variations of bosses maybe in like a Hades kind of way um and it's got like some new areas and like new stuff to do at your camp and it's just got what seems to be like a relatively like decent upgrade and I remember looking at thinking like oh this is all cool stuff but like it doesn't sound like a paid DLC so I really hope they don't charge you for it and then of course it was a free DLC uh like a free update so just shout out to them like I I think that's such a good sign from a developer when they're putting out like free updates to a game that like seemed like it was finished in the first place Um, Mm -hmm. and i haven't Mm -hmm. played calls of the lamb it's been on my list for a while i thought it looked really neat um and this just makes me like you know want to play it even more so to call the lamb and putting out free dlcs because like you definitely could have charged 15 dollars for that and you didn't so tons of respect (laughs) yeah yeah you know it's so funny um calls of the lamb i almost bought it the other day it's on sale on the switch right now it's only 18 bucks and wow, we'll get this DLC. Deal. So if you want to get it, mm-hmm. you know, it'd be fun. Maybe both of us could get it. Mm-hmm. We could talk about yeah, it. Yeah, it does seem um, like a good Switch game. Yeah. Uh, speaking of, well, it also used to run like shit on the Switch. Apparently it was updated now and it's actually like fine. So that's okay. Cool. Um, speaking of games that uh, give out free DLC, like it's just Christmas every day and they always give out <laughs> tons of DLC for free. It's Yacht Club and Shovel Knight Pocket yeah. Dungeon. The game that just keeps on giving. Oh, Shovel Knight just keeps on giving in general, but... Um, free DLC for Pocket Dungeon. Now, Pocket Dungeon I have not played, and I feel like that's really sinful because of how much I love, you know, Shovel Knight regular. Um, mm-hmm. But Pocket Dungeon, for what it to its credit, looks like an excellent um, puzzle game. You know, it's got like so much going for it in terms of like the Shovel Knight flavor on what those type of like puzzle games can be. Um, I think that the fact that it's called Pocket Dungeon is not great for it because it's not a mobile game. <laughs> Like it, it really, really does sound like a mobile game, doesn't you know, it? I don't know if it's on mobile, like it might be, and there's nothing wrong with it if it is, but like this is a switch game, and like it's on your p s four and like this is not a mobile mm-hmm. first game, and I feel like that's like not good. <laughs> I just want to say yeah. that, but like there's just so much content in here, right, like you're playing a shovel night, there's like two new characters, there's different like things you pick up, there's equipment, like this is like why is this game even going as hard as it does, like it's just a matching game, you know, but it's like. <laughs> Yeah. Just the level of quality they put into this franchise is unbelievable. Um, and it's like, it's a matter of if not when, when I play Pocket Dungeon, but it's definitely like moving up uh, because of getting this DLC, right? Like it's just, it's just added value that's coming mm-hmm. in for free, like you said. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm surprised it took you this long to mention that. I was like, oh, there's well, a show I know, I know, I know. It's just because I haven't um, played Pocket Dungeon, you know? Yeah, <laughs> so. exactly. But hey, it seems like the best time to get into it. 
Um, I think there's one, one other more? thing I had on mine to mention, and this one's interesting because like I don't know how much like the trailer for the game really interests me, but like I just got a shout out Animal Well, like um, yeah, okay, Donkey was Donkey so, showed up. <laughs> it is yeah, so Donkey was here, which is crazy. It's um oh I'm blanking on what his studio is called, Big Mode Games. Big Mode, that's yeah. It. So he made Big Mode, and he this is like the first game being published by Big Mode, which is Animal Well. And it looks like a really Speaking strange... of Donkey, he's going to show up yeah, on the TV right, yeah. on, uh, right he's now. He's going to fall in that river real quick. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's just like such an awkward trailer. and like, But it's it's kind of neat. It looks like a really strange, like surreal, kind of like creepy, like puzzle platforming game. It looks like there's a lot of like player agency. Like what you talked about earlier in Resident Evil, like pulling the boulder. Like I feel like that is like the whole like philosophy behind this game is like there's so going to be a lot of ways to interact with things and i think like a ch- it's hard to convey that kind of a game in a trailer because you can only really show like clips of like someone doing something but you can't really show the a clip of like here are all the you know 20 options that they could have interacted with this scenario and they chose to you know like do it this way so I, I think like this game is such a question mark, but because it's a question mark, I think it's interesting. And then also like the pedigree of having Donkey behind it, like he's never published a game before. Like to my knowledge, he's not like made games. He's not a game developer, but from what I've seen of his channel, like, yeah, there's just some like funny, you know, dumb jokey videos, but he's also done some, what I think are really interesting, um, breakdowns of games on his channel and i think he's actually got a really creative mind for it and i think the things he looks for are like really unique experiences that kind of push the envelope of like how mechanics can interact with the game and like change how you approach something so all of that packaged up into like a weird as fuck looking game like animal well <laughs> like i'm i'm really curious about it like it strikes me as almost like doing like what undertale did and just kind of like blowing people away in in a sense so mm, mm-hmm. it, it's got a lot of potential yeah that, that's what i was gonna say about the game is like uh animal well itself very dramatic piano music going on here now uh, for those <laughs> um, <laughs> sounds like there's a train that's about to like run off a track <laughs> you know <laughs> that's what's kind of going oh no spider-man um, <laughs> animal well like yeah I, to me the game isn't what's fascinating it's how does it do as donkey's first publishing deal just because mm-hmm. like you know as a very notable person that critiques and talks about games online what would happen if if he like published a flop you know or like something mm-hmm. something to that effect. I don't think that'll be the case. Like, and you know, he probably doesn't even have that much involvement in the game being made itself. He's publishing, right? Like he's if he mm-hmm. he knows what he's looking for, like that's a very interesting thing because there's not been a lot of people like of his maybe I'm talking to my ass here a little bit, but it seems like there's not a lot of people coming from like where he's his background that are like now just like all of a sudden publishing mm-hmm. and like able to bring games from his perspective to the forefront. Like, yeah. it's a very unique position. So I hope it's successful because I agree, like, when he's when he's being critical and, like, um, you know, not doing the joke stuff, like, I agree with a lot of what he says. So it'll be cool to see, like, if he's selected the right game to show off, like, something he's proud of for the first one. Uh, yeah, cool. and like you said, it'll be interesting, too, to see if, like, this becomes more of a thing. Like, if more platforms mm-hmm. and, like, people who are just kind of, like, voices in the industry end up taking, like... Yeah. a very like active role within the industry like it reminds me of like when i watch like i still watch league of legends don't don't crucify me i don't play it i swear <laughs> i just watch it <laughs> um but like i've noticed over the years of like watching it while i work out like a lot of players have taken roles of like being coaches or um they become like you know, like the color, like analysts, like during the game and like they're commentating and like people are moving around in the space. And it's because it's like a relatively new, like, play, like area to work in. Right. So like, mm-hmm, it's kind mm-hmm. of like evolving and changing as like people get into it and start like doing different positions. So like, yeah, this kind of strikes me as the same kind of vein of like someone who's like in the industry in a sense, but they're like now like taking a different niche so it'd be kind of neat if like a lot of like you know these like kind of small publishers pop up of people yeah, who like yeah. our voices already and like instead of just critiquing or analyzing or like you know giving commentary they're now like you yeah know, it, fulfilling it's kind that of, extra step role it's kind of surprising to me that it hasn't 
I mean, it probably has yeah. happened, but like it hasn't happened to like our in our periphery to this point. Mm-hmm. But um, I don't know. It's interesting, too, because I think there's a lot of people that think they know a lot of stuff about games that really would like completely fail because like the way the industry works is so different to what people would expect like you and I like we, we I'm like we could probably run a publisher right but like there's so many things we wouldn't have thought mm-hmm. about like it's got to be tough so like I I'm sure Dunkey's equipped like obviously he's huge and has a lot of resources but um yeah cool to see mm-hmm. um very quickly little to the left how have we not talked about this game before after playing <laughs> unpacking Kate um I mean yes. this this is a game about organizing shit in cupboards and in drawers and they all have nice little places that they fit properly and you're like putting things in I've never seen this come across my view, but I'm definitely going to look at this now because this thing is like, this is therapy in a game. I need to <laughs> yeah, so this, I think, is a DLC, the little on the left. Yes, yeah, yeah. The game is already I mean, out. Yeah, I think it's free um, DLC as well. Um, uh, is it? I'm not sure. Maybe I, I it's have not the free. feeling this one was paid, but okay, um, well. I imagine it's it's relatively cheap. But yeah, this game just looks cute. Like, I don't know if there's a narrative aspect to it, like unpacking hat. Yeah. Um, but it's just like really beautiful art and you just put stuff away and like, okay, I'm looking at my kitchen and it's like, I, I could go put that stuff away, but that's, that's not like satisfying. That's not going <laughs> to no. de-stress me, but putting stuff away in a really beautifully painted kitchen, like, I don't know yeah. why that's better. <laughs> and like, they're putting things in those little boxes and then you put something in the right spot and a little thing pops out the other side yeah. and there's more spots for other little things. And oh, I man. think the gimmick to this game too, is that there's like cats in the house like occasionally a cat just like walks over and they're like oh well let me help you like you know they like walk over the table you're putting stuff away on like it's just so incredibly cute like if any idiot ever tells you video games are problematic and they cause violence show them a little on the left (laughs) (laughs) like i who could not enjoy this like it's just so pleasant (laughs) amen i love it And with that, we'll move on to another pleasant segment that we like to do here on the show. And that's called Listener Mail, everybody. Um, If you want to be cool and write in to ask us a question for the next show, you can do so. Um, We would love if you did that to cloudcontrolpod at proton.me. Or, of course, you can get in touch with us on Twitter as well if you'd rather ask your question there. But we answer a question every single show. And today we have a great question from Jay uh, who wrote in. Uh, And I think, Kate, you've got it open, right? Yeah. I do, yeah. So Jay's asked, um, so obviously we know the N64 Nintendo Online has been out recently to great success. James, you've been playing some Pokemon Stadium. I did. Uh, we had a pretty epic showdown the other we, day. <laughs> it <was laughs> it came awesome. down to what, Nidoran female yeah. versus my Rattata? <laughs> yeah, it was an epic showdown. So, it was an epic battle. Um, but anyway, so he's asked, what are the next three games you hope get announced for the N64 on Nintendo Online? So yeah. it's already got a pretty stacked uh, like library of games. Like it's not massive, but every single game on there is like really high quality or like would definitely be on the top of someone's list, I feel. 100%. And, you know, after looking up a list of like, you know, top N64 games to, to make my mind, you know, go and where I wanted to take this question, there really isn't a lot of like wow, those are amazing games left that need to come to this system, I don't think. You know, like they really, looking back, it doesn't have like a huge selection of like must-haves, well, in my opinion. I don't know. But come I got some good ones, though. Big hitters that uh, actually are missing. <laughs> <laughs> well, what are they then? Why don't you tell me? <laughs> All right. Well, so the problem is, is I've actually come up with five games mm-hmm. I really want to be on there. So I'll give you my three and maybe two honorable okay. mentions. But yeah. I just have to shout out the game I would have put on here, but was shocked to find out is actually already there is Pokemon um, Puzzle League. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> we had that game and it was fun. It was basically just like Tetris, but like the blocks were like Pokemon. Yeah, it's like um, Bejeweled more so. Like you're switching the the places of things. yeah maybe yeah. it's more like bejeweled but it was like they were like the pokemon elements and if you got in a fire like a fire pokemon would like attack the enemy or something it was like a versus like yeah it was just like it probably wasn't good but i remember it being really fun and i was shocked that it made it on the list of games <laughs> on the n64 um so the games that i want maybe let's go back do you want to go back and forth yeah let's go because back we forth. might have some um Relaxer. Let's go back and forth. I'll I'll say my two honorable mentions first, if that's cool with you. Okay. Um, number okay. one is gonna be um uh, little, little, uh shoot, what's it called? Snowboard Kids. Because uh, I have a different racing game on here and I just couldn't put snowboard kids 
uh, oh on there. God, okay, I have <laughs> I, I have the exact same thing. Snowboard Kids was actually the first game I wrote down and thought yeah. of because like it probably I have no idea if it's good, but I remember renting it a few times and it was fun and like you just played as like random kids like snowboarding. Yeah, it was. I mean, who knows yeah. if it was any good? Like you said, right? And the other one I wanted to shout out uh, was Tony Hawk's Pro Skater Two, just be- just for you. And uh, just because I've actually never really played it to completion, and I think it's good from what I've seen, but I would like to play it one day just to, you know, go through and see why it's so renowned as one of the best games of all time. Wow. That's all. Shockingly, (laughs) I don't have that on my list. (laughs) And uh, I really hope they don't put that trash on the online system that I don't even pay for. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh no i'm just kidding uh that's that's sure, certainly fun um my other honorable mention is diddy kong racing i put it yeah. with snowboard kids with, like two good racing games diddy kong had like the cool story mode i remember being really fun and obviously like the best level was the one where you flew around in the volcano and like carried the eggs yeah that was fun like that, that was, was the best part of the game and i'll fight anyone on that <laughs> i totally agree Totally agree. Um, okay, are you, that's all your. That's all your. Uh, Those are honorable mentions. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so the first game. Then this will lead me into my first one. My first one is Diddy Kong Racing, and uh, I think that's a great pod. The pod racer, cart racer. Um, <laughs> and I, you know what? I so cool about it. I just remember being in the plane, like being able to choose the plane or the cart or the hovercraft, and thinking like after being such a Mario Kart fan before that, being like wow, this is so cool having three vehicles. Like this is a total game changer. And I, and like doing the story mode was so fun going around that hub world and like figuring out how to, you know, get behind the waterfall and all this stuff. I, I just thought that was a great experience. Who knows if it's still fun now? Mario Kart's probably you know, better, but fun game. I would say Mario Kart's like a better franchise overall, but for the N64 entries, I would say Diddy Kong kicks yeah. Mario Kart's ass I think, for the N64. I think for sure. Like, there's so much more to do. There's the area. Like, I even think, like, when you get items, you can, like, use them right away. Or you can keep going to get another item to, like, upgrade them. So, like, mm-hmm. there's an element of strategy that Mario doesn't have. Like, it was, a, like, I would love to see this come out as, like, a new 2024, like, you know, That's reimagining. True. The story, like, the single player story mode is really what sets it apart. Like, if it's, yeah, it's way beyond what Mario had. Right. There was, like, boss races and stuff like it was mm-hmm. really cool yeah so, like ctr as well um, honestly ctr same thing yeah it's really mario well, kart that lacks okay so that is probably the correct answer but i went the chaos route and for my racing game i said i want iggy's wrecking balls i picked iggy's wrecking balls too <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's my third game yes okay so this game, it's honestly more out of curiosity because, like, I was racking my brain for, like, what N64 games did we play? And then this, I got reminded of this. Like, it's some kind of, like, Lovecraftian horror racing game. Like, you were, like, these weird balls, but they all had, like, faces. And, like, one was a dinosaur. I want to say one was, like, a clown. Like, it was kind of repulsive to look at, to be yeah, honest. Yeah, they're weird. I'm, br- I'm going to bring yeah, up a like, video for those watching on, on video and that right guy now. was just teeth. <laughs> It's just me. oh my god charlie he's a clown <laughs> like it's so incredibly ugly but the weird thing was is like you'd race but like you use like all the they had like all had mouths and like tongues and you'd use like the tongue to like grapple on stuff so like a lot of the races would be like actually like going up a tower or something because you'd be like grappling up to platforms and like it was just so weird. And well, I think it's probably the worst racing game we've talked about so far. It's the one I want to replay the most because like, it's so weird. And I want to remember exactly what it was like. <laughs> yeah, you know, the more we're watching at this video now, I don't think it was good. <laughs> but no, this looks... I, I almost guarantee it was bad. But like, yeah, you could get pretty good momentum with like grappling up the stuff like and like I feel like the swinging was not easy. Like you had to get okay at it. Yeah, I mean, I would love to try this too. We should try this sometime. Yeah. Iggy's wrecking like, ball, it, folks. It's <laughs> not because it's a good game. It's because I it would be the most interested to go back and revisit it than the other games. Yeah, no, I'm with you too. But I picked it the same for this, like the same reason. And I just remember that we had, we rented it so often. Like I remember <laughs> we would always go to Blockbuster and rent a game. You know, once yeah. or a month or whatever. And this was like probably like three or four times at least we'd rented this like to the point where we probably should have just bought it at some point but never did I think mm-hmm. it was like hard to find like 
I don't know. I'd never yeah. seen, I'd never known anyone else that's owned this game. Like it's just one of those weird ones that was on the rental shelf and we just kind of <laughs> played it. Who knows? Um, the other game I had on my list that we've not talked about yet was uh, Star Wars Pod Racer. That was an N64 okay. game. I think we actually had it on the computer out of like some like PC oh, thing or something. Yeah, but maybe. this was an N64 game. And, you know, it's weird that I went with three racing games, but the N64, yeah, I guess, you- was good for that. <laughs> Um, I remember Pod Racer just being so fun, and like the thing I liked about it the most was that you got to see like your engines and their like health meters, and I thought mm-hmm. that was so cool back in the day because you'd crash in Mario Kart and it doesn't matter, but Pod Racer you'd have like, oh shit, my left engine is like on fire and breaking, like I can't crash on the left because it's gonna break, so now I have to drive like really cautiously and like protect that side. It was just kind of a cool wrinkle. Um, I mean. I can't remember the characters. I think Sabalba is one of them. I like his name, so I remember him yep. being cool. <laughs> so yeah, that was fun. I yeah. mean, it was a hard game from what I remember. I, I know there was like it a jump, was. like that ice level at some point. You had to go over a jump and it was so hard to like line your pod racer up. But then again, why does it matter if you're on ice, like you're hovering? It really doesn't make any yeah. sense. There were a couple levels that had jumps. It was definitely one of the more difficult games. I think I I read something about it, about how like unbalanced it was with like, cause mm-hmm. you choose your racer and then you choose like the pod racer. Yeah. Is it called a pod racer? A racer? Yeah, yeah. Or is it the <laughs> racer's your... pod? Is the pod is racer? The racer's pod? <laughs> is, the ra- is the pod racer the racer or, the, or the vehicle? Uh-oh, Star Wars nerds, help us out. <laughs> um, I don't know. So you, you choose your your vehicle for locomotion um, and you choose your pilot of the vehicle uh, as two separate things. If I remember. No, correctly. no, no. I think they come um, together. I think they come, they all have their own. I'm almost hundred like percent sure. Story mode, you had to use it, but then in like the regular oh. races, you could like mix and match, I want to say, mm-hmm. but I'm pretty sure I read something that somewhere like is so objectively worse that like there's a level where like it has a big jump and some characters and like their pods just legitimately can't make it over that jump. Like it's physically impossible <laughs> for them because they have like crappier stats than other races. And I don't know if that's true. I just remember reading that on the internet somewhere and like it, it's okay. totally the kind of game where you could see that like being legitimate. <laughs> that makes me feel a lot better because I remember not making the jump often. So it's I would just like hard. to think that I would just like to think that my favorite character was slow. That's yeah, all. like I'm pretty sure it's like the shark guy. Like I think there's like a shark mm. alien and he cannot make that jump. <laughs> awesome. So I mean, obviously Anakin can, like he's the best 10 year old ever, but like it's, it's a hard jump. Oh, um, man. Man, that's, well, that's all game my games too, I got though. for this. This is this is great. I'd like I all these games to come game. 1064. I, I agree with your list. Um, I've got two other games that we haven't talked about that are on my list because mm-hmm, I only mm-hmm. had Iggy's as the double up. Uh, I put Smash, um, the OG like. Smash yeah, that's Bros. not on there. That's true. Hmm. It's not on there, and I mean, I think Smash Ultimate like is the the pinnacle Smash game. Like, I think that like, like if I want to play Smash, like Smash Ultimate is obviously like the best choice. But I think it would be fun to go back and have a night or two of like reliving the old game because we played that so much like our n64 was like a smash console like largely like Mm -hmm. we played so much like the levels are so nostalgic and like all the old characters and yeah some of them really haven't changed much but i would love to go back and like see what it feels like um and then the last game i want i put on here is a game i legitimately just want to play like not just out of curiosity but the like original like banjo game uh, on the n64 Mm -hmm. like that is such a highly acclaimed se- like he came to smash it's such a highly acclaimed series and the n64 one is supposed to be like the like golden one and mm-hmm. so i've never played it and if it was on the switch online and i could you know i had access to it and in a fantasy world we were allowed to buy a month and not have to subscribe the whole year <laughs> um i would just i would just be interested to go back and, and try like such a highly acclaimed no. game is that not on Game Pass? There's a bunch that of Banjo, Banjo stuff game? on Game Pass, and Banjo's owned by Rare. That is true. There's a bunch of Banjo stuff on Game Pass. Uh-huh. I don't know if they have that one, but there is a lot. I feel like it'd be weird to have the N64 one on Game Pass, but I hope. I mean, yeah, it but is. it could be part of a collection though, because there's and like I'm a... stalling to yeah. go look at it up right now. <laughs> I've got it open. Right. Um, there are no search results found for There's Banjo, none, none. but you know what? I wonder, it might be a console only. I have PC games. Yeah, it could be. We'll look and into so, it. So 
Mm-hmm. I'll do some research. That, but uh, anyway, great I episode. I hear he's a here, pretty you know? bear. So yeah, are you more of a banjo or a kazooie fan? Um, because I like yeah, I'm all about kazooie. Yeah, <laughs> banjo's kind of weird. But, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Isn't he, he's like kind of the dumb one, right? In kazooie. I mean, like I assume the... he's dumb because that's got the way it's got to work. I don't know. It seems it's like the just, trope, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Our bias is always correct. So <laughs> the band exactly. is an absolute himbo. <laughs> exactly. Oh, man. That's the quote you come to this podcast for, everybody. Banjo is an absolute himbo. <laughs> and he's a himbo. And Kazooie's like, I don't know. Maybe. I think Kazooie's like rude or something. Like they're kind of yeah, like a weird something like duo, that. if I remember correctly. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Um, <laughs> folks, this has been a podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you've stuck through it all the way here. I think this has been a great show. We've talked about some good stuff and given you some excellent N64 recommendations, not only if they come to N64, but also if you want to look up some kind of emulation thing, I'm not going to stop you. So go look at these great games, play some Mickey's Wrecking Balls and enjoy yourself. <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and everything in between, this has been Cloud Control. And we'll be back next week. Um, So remember, this is the gaming podcast. It's not just good. It's good enough. And we'll see you on the next episode. Bye.